Itong image na to ay probably isa sa mga pinakasikat na scientific illustrations of all time. It is also very wrong. This iconic image is called the March of Progress. Ginawa ito ng isang Russian artist na si Rudolf Salinger noong 1965 para gamitin as illustration sa isang book called Early Man. Ang original na illustration ay spread out in four and a half pages na may labing limang uri ng primates. Pag finold mo yung mga pages, anim lang yung primates na mag appear at imbes na yung buong 15, yung anim na primates lang ang sumikat. Ang issue kasi sa abbreviated na version and even yung original na 15 is yung pagsuggest nito na ang evolution ay isang linear na transformation ng organisms into better versions ng ancestors nila. Isa din sa mga obvious mistakes ng illustration is yung pag-imply na galing tayo directly sa mga Neanderthals o di kaya sa unggoy. Hindi tayo direct descendants ng mga Neanderthals at unggoy. In fact, nag-coexist nga tayo with the Neanderthals for about 5,000 years and probably had interbred with them for some 45,000 years ago. At dahil sa illustration na to, naging synonymous tuloy ang evolution sa linear na progression. Mali ang linear na progress kasi hindi naman sinabi ng theory of evolution ni Charles Darwin ang makabuo tayo ng new species linearly. If we are to accurately illustrate evolution, it would look more like a complex tree na may maraming branches. Na yung iba nag-extend yung branch up to the present time, while yung iba gradually became extinct throughout the different time periods. Kagaya nito. But to be fair sa book, hindi naman nito exactly sinabi na we evolved from a hairy primate in a linear fashion. Ang libro na isinulat ng isang American anthropologist na si Francis Clark Howell even warned the readers na huwag i-interpret yung illustration literally as a linear progression from one species directly to the next. Pero yun na nga, bumenta yung libro at imbes na yung content ni Howell ay eh, yung illustration ni Zalinger ang naging extremely popular. The theory of evolution by natural selection made huge success in describing the natural world for the past 150 years. Pero kamanghamangha din na isa ito sa mga scientific theories na nami-misunderstood. Siguro yung illustration ang isa sa mga dahilan. O siguro ibang story lang talaga ang na-indoctrinate sa atin at a younger age kaya sadyang mahirap siyang intindihin. Whatever man yung dahilan, I hope makatulong ang video na to para ma-unlearn mo yung mga common misconceptions about the theory. But before that, I'm going to go ahead and encourage you to subscribe to my channel. If gusto mo yung mga seryosong topics na ganito sa YouTube feed mo, click mo lang yung subscribe button. At pakiclick mo na lang din yung bell icon para pag may new uploads ako, manonotify ka kaagad. Your support will be very helpful in improving the quality of future videos kaya hit that subscribe button now. Alright, let's continue. Yung unang misconception is yung idea na linear na progression ang evolution instead of it being branch-like. Here is common misconception number two, saying, it's just a theory. A certain fraction ng mga tao ay eh, nire-reject talaga ang science. Sasabihin nila na, hindi naman talaga natin alam kung totoo ba talaga yan. Theory lang kasi yan. Ang mga ganitong klaseng statement just shows na marami pa din talaga sa atin ang nag-hold ng maling beliefs o pag-unawa sa mga concepts na ginagamit ng siyensya. Pag kasi gumagamit tayo ng salitang theory, in common language, we mean guess o haka-haka. Sa science, pag sinabi natin meron tayong guess o haka-haka, ang tamang scientific term doon is hypothesis. Ang hypothesis ay ang pansamantalang explanation sa mga bagay na na-o-observe natin gamit ang ating senses para mangolekta ng datos. For example, nahulog yung prutas ng bayabas from one of its branches. Siguro we would hypothesize na yung speed ng pagbagsak ng object ay nagdedepende sa kanilang bigat. With that hypothesis in mind, we would then be able to make predictions. We can now predict na yung mga mabibigat na bagay would fall faster sa mga bagay na magagaan. Obviously, yung prutas ng bayabas would fall faster than a bayabas leaf, right? Now with our prediction, Pwede na tayo makagawa ng experiment that will either support or refute our hypothesis sa pamamagitan ng pagkumpara ng result ng ating experiment sa ating predictions. Galileo was rumored to have dropped various objects from the top of the Leaning Tower of Pisa noong 
1589. We can do the same gamit ang Max Candy at Balahibo ng Manok at yung result would seem to support our hypothesis. Pero pag nagkokonda kasi tayo ng scientific experiment, ang ideal na situation is ilimit ang experiment sa isang variable na pwede nating mamanipula, which is yung bigat ng bagay. And another variable na dapat ay magbago base sa kung ano man ang bigat ng object na ihulog natin. That is, kung meron ngang ugnayan ang bigat ng isang bagay sa rate ng pagpagsak nila sa lupa. So kung ang tinetest natin ay ang correlation ng bigat ng isang bagay sa bilis ng kanilang pagbagsak sa lupa, then kailangan nating i-test drop ang mga bagay na magkapareho in every way maliban lang sa bigat. Like identical na bowling balls o di kaya Rubik's Cube na magkaiba lang ang bigat. Hindi pwede yung max candy at balahibo ng manok kasi hindi sila pareho ng shape o wind resistance. Sa ganitong paraan, lahat ng result na makokolekta natin will be specific sa kung ano man yung focus ng hypothesis natin. Nakita ni Galileo na same pala ang rate ng pagbagsak ng dalawang objects na magkaiba ang bigat. This refutes our hypothesis at mapipilitan tayong ayusin yung correct hypothesis natin o di kaya gumawa ng panibago. A hypothesis isn't something you prove, it's something you test. In our previous example, yung hypothesis natin ay nirefute ni Galileo. Pero hindi ito bad news kasi that means we just eliminated a wrong hypothesis. Pag meron na tayong nakolekt ang enough correct hypotheses, pwede natin silang igrupo and turn them into something na mas greater. A theory. A theory is the way we know something works. Base sa mga nakolekta nating evidence and all the correct and incorrect hypotheses na naput to test. Being a theory isn't a bad thing. It means na ilang experiments na ang nagpapakita na sapat itong explanation sa lahat ng observations nito sa isang specific na phenomenon. Evolution is a fact. It is purposeless o wala itong layunin, foresightless o wala itong plano para sa hinaharap, It is an extremely costly process kasi ilang milyong buhay ang na-waste because of just how it works. And it's extremely slow. Kaya siguro maraming hindi naniniwala kasi aside sa fact na maraming misconception about sa theory, eh hindi ito compatible sa intelligent design na argument. Ang evolution by natural selection is a theory. Nakagawa na tayo ng ilang libong hypotheses para dito. Nakagawa ng mga tests. Tinapon yung mga maling hypothesis at dahil doon nakadevelop tayo ng isang panukala o framework for predicting how living things change over time. The next time you hear someone say na, Hey, I have a theory kung bakit laging naglalaan on their feet ang mga pusa. May magnet kasi ang mga paa nila at namamagnet sila sa lupa. Tell them, hindi yan theory. That's a hypothesis. And finally, misconception number three. The theory of evolution is a theory about the origin of life. The origin of living organisms from non-living material is called abiogenesis. Importante na madistinguish natin ito from evolution. Hindi evolution ang abiogenesis. Ang evolution ay ang proseso ng pag-iiba-iba ng mga living things from earlier forms of living things. No comment ang theory of evolution sa topic kung paano ang life na mula. So how did the first life originate? According sa abiogenesis theory, despite sa pagkakaiba-iba ng mga living things na nakikita natin ngayon, sa fundamental level, lahat na ng living things contain these three elements. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Oh, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just joking. It's nucleic acid, proteins, and lipids. May story kung paano na-form ang tatlong elements na to at hindi ko na i-discuss yun kasi medyo technical na. Pero ito yung high-level overview kung paano sila plausibly nakabuo ng simple life forms. May dalawang pong uri ng amino acids and for now, just think of them as Lego pieces na may kanya-kanyang unique shape. At kagaya ng Lego, pwede silang magpatong-patong sa each other pero instead na Lego helicopter, ay eh, mga different varieties ng proteins yung nabubuo nila. May dalawang varieties naman ang nucleic acid, DNA and RNA. Maraming functions ang DNA and RNA, pero yung isa sa pinaka-well understood talaga nilang function is ang i-instruct ang amino acids paano nila i-group yung mga sarili nila para makabuo ng iba't ibang varieties ng proteins. 
Now, before pa man makabuo ng protein ang DNA, RNA, at amino acids, kailangan nila ng physical interaction. At sa sobrang lawak ng dagat sa panahon na yun, siguro most of them would just float around aimlessly. Insert lipids. Lipid molecules have a unique structure. Yung head part nila loves water, pero yung tail part nila hates water. So what tends to happen is, when a bunch of lipids are floating around in water, may tendency silang mag-group together and mag-self-assemble in spheres. Bakit sphere? Kasi yung tail nila tends to face other tails ng other lipids para makalayo sila sa tubig. And since yung head nila likes water, ini-expose nila yung head nila outside and inside sa sphere. Parang ganito. So to recap, ang lipids ay natural na nagko-combine into spheres. DNA, RNA, amino acids, and other various chemicals get trapped inside these spheres that could potentially interact, combine, react, and work together to perhaps eventually form a living cell version na kayang mag-self-replicate. To be fair, hindi ibig sabihin na pag nag-combine ang tatlong importanteng elements na to ay automatic na makakabuo na sila ng self-replicating living cell. Right now, there's no one in the field of science na alam ang tamang sagot sa mystery na to. Walang hard evidence or experiment na makakaturo sa precise na mekanismo kung paano nabuwang isang self-replicating living cell at some point in the past. May mga arguments ang mga creationists na there's no way daw for a functioning watch to have been magically formed inside a bowl that contains all the parts of a watch that's been steered for a million years. May ginawa pang ang estimates ang ibang scientists na ang probability daw ng mga chemicals grouping together on their own to make a single bacterium is 1 in 10 to the 40,000th power. In short, it's an impossibility. Pero oversimplification kasi yung estimation ng other scientists and the watch parts in a bowl argument ng mga creationists. Hini-ignore nila ang fact that complex life forms like the modern day bacteria almost certainly did not exist immediately. Yung actual na probability is hindi kung paano ang ilang daang complex chemicals ang naghalo-halo to form a modern day bacterium kundi ang probability na ilang chemicals ang naghalo-halo to form the primary ingredients for life. Ingredients na may have chemically evolved over time to form the simplest kind of life form. Parang evolution din ang nangyari, pero instead na biological yung process, it happened chemically. Sa evolution by natural selection, pinapaboran ang mga organismo na may best chance of survival and reproduction. Ano kaya ang naghimok sa mga chemicals para mag-evolve ito into something na complex enough needed for biological functioning? Actually, walang may magandang sagot about dito until last 2014. Si Jeremy England, isang physics professor ng MIT, showed mathematically that the driving force for chemical evolution may be hidden in physics. According kay England, a group of molecules will restructure themselves pag inexpose mo daw sila to an external source of energy like the sun. Para sa kanya, ito daw yung driving force for chemical evolution. Ang theory niya ay further supported by a 2011 paper by Caro Michaelian. It showed na both RNA and DNA are the most efficient of all known molecules for absorbing the intense ultraviolet rays of the sun. Though walang generally accepted theory for the origin of life, lahat ng credible proposals ay nagpapakita na ang complex life forms could have plausibly come from simple life forms na nabuo through a slow process of chemical and molecular evolution over a long period of time. May proof ba tayo dito? Wala. At least not yet. I have a hypothesis. Kaya siguro lagi tayong nagkakamali kasi lagi nating ginagamit ang ating common sense. Gamit common sense, facts like bacteria are related to humans or we shared a common ancestor with every one of the animals in the zoo would be really hard for anyone to accept. Mas madali kasing i-accept ang literal and biblical na mga pangyayari and for good reason, isunulat ito in a kind of common sense perspective. 
pre-scientific people were trying to explore around them. Some of the conclusions they came up with were actually pretty useful, kagaya na lang ng pagbawal ng pagkain ng baboy, hipon at talaba. Because during that time, common naman talaga ang foodborne illnesses at wala din silang mga refrigerators. Pero pinalitan natin yung mga ideas nila over time as science and technology reveal more of the universe secrets. Kaya siguro maraming mga non-scientists ang wala talagang trust sa modern theory of evolution kasi mas binavalue nila ang kanilang common sense kesa sa empirical evidence. Kaya marami tuloy ang nagko-cognitive dissonance. Pero ang pinakapangit na epekto talaga nito ay ang anti-science feelings among the general public. Shoutout kay Danny J. Escote. Salamat sa pag-share ng Facebook page ko and this YouTube channel sa mga atheist friends mo. You guys are one of the reasons why I keep doing what I do. Salamat sa kind words and sa support. Shoutout din kay Atheist Joy Philippines. Thank you for continuously mentioning my YouTube channel sa mga videos mo. Again, maraming salamat sa suporta and congratulations sa success ng channel mo. Sa mga nanood, thank you for staying this long. I hope to see you in the next video.